hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Food and Drink Tech Hub uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Alistair Trail and I am the project manager for the Tech Hub Food and Drink Business Development Project. So thanks for joining us today for this uh, as I said, food, and drink, uh, food Trends and New Product Development webinar. Um, I'm just very quickly going to give you an overview of, of the project and then we'll pass on to our uh, fantastic speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, I just need to pass on apologies. Uh, one of the speakers has had a family emergency, so she will not be able to present today. That's Teddy from uh, her her business. So, uh, so I've just asked speakers if they if they want to talk for an extra five minutes or so in their presentations, then that that's the case, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So, just an introduction. Um, the the Food and Drink Tech Hub Business Support Service uh, provides business support, uh, technical advice, and events to develop an existing growing network of food and drink uh, businesses and supply chain uh, businesses. So today's webinar is on food trends and new product development. So we've now got three uh, fantastic speakers who will pass on their knowledge and experience of food trends and how food trend information has helped them develop new products and get these to markets. I've also got a presentation as well on uh, the science of food formulation. But before I, uh, I pass on to the, the introduce the speakers, I just really wanted to provide a really brief uh, overview of, of the project. So the, the Tech Hub, uh, Food and Drink Tech Hub Business Support Service is a, is a three year project uh, to work with 300 food and drink businesses in the, in the Highland Council area. So that can be <clears throat> supply chain businesses, so from primary producers all the way to, to food service and um, retail. Uh, Businesses uh, out with the Highland Council area can participate in, in the programme, so in workshops, uh, events, and use our online resources. But the one to one delivery is part of the project. It's only available for businesses in the Highland Council area. And that's with how the, how the project's funded. Uh, so the project includes uh, a number of different parts of delivery. So we're trying to support businesses to develop their growth plans and facilitate and broker our specialist and technical support. We're trying to raise awareness and increase implementation of new technologies such as digital automation and uh, we're trying to uh, develop collaborations between businesses uh, between the public sector and academia uh, to help deliver innovative projects that benefit the food and drink sector and also we're we're providing insights into what the businesses require uh, to develop the services that will be available from the actual physical tech hub so the physical tech hub is going to be a, a food innovation center, which is going to be built at All Ness, just outside Inverness. That will have development kitchens, uh, spaces for packaging, for up upscaling recipes, and so forth. They'll also have meeting rooms, uh, innovation space, uh, event space, and it's really going to be a hub for collaboration and innovation in the food and drink sector in the Highlands. So this uh, this this support service is all focused on trying to support the delivery of that that center. So these are the areas that we're working in, uh, but the program is flexible and we'll adapt our delivery to suit uh, the business needs. So if we get feedback that we need an event or support a certain area, we'll adapt the program to do that. So we're working in areas like product development, uh, which this this um, this uh, webinar today is going to support prototype testing, scaling up. We've also done some work in packaging and product labeling, uh, food safety, shelf life, nutritional analysis. Uh, we've done some previous work in sustainability and net zero, low carbon and waste management. Also, I've done uh, some excellent work with branding, marketing, uh, business planning, e-commerce, and also more technical stuff like equipment specification, factory layout, technical tr troubleshooting. Uh, so these are the areas we worked in, but we are say we're open to working in other areas as well that will help businesses of the islands. We have a website up and running, which is uh, on on high website. Uh, if you just look for Tech Hub. And on that website, you'll see information about the events, the one-to-one -one support. You can also register your interest, which will give you access to all the support that's available. And we'll set up a one-to-one -one discussion online with you to understand your business and, and talk to you specifically how the program can help help you. And we also have a podcast up and running. Uh, we've just recorded podcast number five, uh, which is Food and Drink Business Bites. So if you are interested in listening to that, then, then please just go through your, your normal platform um, and you'll see them there. So briefly, this is how we're delivering the work. So we have um, had a launch event, and you can you can register on our our website. Uh, there, that gives you opportunity to have a support call and the signposting service, which I just mentioned. 
also delivering technical and uh, networking workshops. So it's a combination of face-to-face -face workshops. We're doing some online ones like today, and we're also doing some short one-hour technical webinars. We've got insights and best practice. As I say, we're creating videos, uh, podcasts, and infographics. And then we have the one-to-one -one support. So we have innovation clinics where businesses can uh, have an online meeting with a panel of experts, and they will give them direct advice to how that they can overcome some challenges. Uh, they send the panel their, info, their questions beforehand, the panel does a bit of research and gets back to them. So we've already done some of them on uh, product development and packaging, and we're hoping to do another, the packaging uh, workshop was so uh, busy, we're hopefully going to be doing another packaging clinic on in uh, late August. Also got common interest groups for businesses that maybe have the same problem, same same area, or in the same subset to get together to collaborate. And uh, we've got two common interest groups up and running at the moment, but we're hoping to do more in August. Also got intensive one-to-one -one support where you get access to uh, an expert who will work with you over well three days of the expert's time, one and a half days uh, with, with, with the company to overcome technical challenges. And we're also going to be doing learning journeys. We will visit some businesses or academic institutions that can, that can share best practice. So this is the plan uh, for today. So that's my introduction and welcome. Uh, so I'll be the after this, be passing on to Aileen Bruce from New Nutrition Business, who's going to do a uh, really fascinating talk on upcoming food and drink ten, uh, trends. Then we have a case study from Aquascot, so from Fiona Stott, who's going to talk about how they develop products for Waitrose. Then we're going to have, have a five minute comfort break. And then, uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, Teddy Hunt from House of Ireland can no longer present, but we'll then move on to Sarah Wilkie from uh, Queen Margaret University, who will talk more about the science of, of food formulation. Then we'll have a Q&A uh, questions at the end and we'll finish it at 12 o'clock or maybe slightly earlier because we've only got the three of the four speakers. And we'll have short time to ask questions after each presentation. So you can either put your questions in the chat function and I can ask them or you can just uh, raise your hand at the end of the presentation and we can um, and we can we can we can do it that way. So I will now uh, stop sharing my screen and I'll pass on to Aileen Bruce who can uh, from New Nutrition Business. So over to you. Hi there, everyone. Can you all hear me? Right. Sorry about that. It's a little technical issue. Um, and thank you for that introduction there, Alistair. That, that was really, really good. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about food, um, food trends and new product development, specifically food and health trends, because that's really what uh, we as a business, New Nutrition Business, are interested in. Um, and although that sounds quite niche, actually, as you know, health has become so mainstream, it's so ubiquitous um, in terms of the considerations that you that you undergo when you're developing new products that hopefully there'll be something for everyone and we'll touch on a broad range of subjects there. OK, so today we're going to look at, first of all, what is a trend? Because there are quite a few different definitions. Um, then we're going to have a look at the five mega trends that we've identified for 2023. And then a little deep dive into some of the key trends, not all of them, but some of them, and what these might mean for your own MPD strategy. So first of all, around what is a trend? So we have our own definition of things that we're looking for um, when it comes to key trends. Every year about this sort of time of year, we um, as a team all meet up in a windowless, hot, sweaty room. And we're not allowed to kind of leave until we've all um, thrown in our ideas, what we're seeing in the marketplace and um, what developments are taking place, what might be the genesis of a new trend. Um, and we use a certain process, which I'll show you just here. And we evaluate all of these ideas that we bring to the table um, around those eight different platforms, looking at consumer needs or marketing strategies, how long this particular trend is from, from the marketplace, um, whether there's any regulatory issues, any um, new nutrition science coming out. So we evaluate on a whole range of different platforms. And what we're really looking for is something that scores highly on as many of those different areas as possible. We're also looking for things that are going to stick around because you know as, as product developers that it's really, really difficult to um, go through that product development pipeline and come up with something ready for market if that trend is going to be effectively a flash in the pan and it's you know, something that's quite an isolated blip. You might miss that market opportunity. So we're re really looking for things that are going to be around for the longer term that gives you that opportunity 
to kind of get involved and and attach your your product to that trend. And secondly, and very importantly, we're looking for things that will produce growth for products and for brands that connect to it. So things that have the opportunity to leverage some revenue and um, to make money effectively. Um, so we're looking for those two things. And the second trend is something that can be quite elusive. So for years and years, we looked at sustainability and every year we would come up with these. Um, if somebody would mention sustainability as a potential key trend and it always scored really highly um, on the first point there around sticking around because we knew it was there, it was there for the long term. But it was quite difficult to see actually how that was going to produce growth in terms of actually generating revenue around that one trend. Things have changed in the last sort of five years and there are ways to to um, to really produce revenue and growth around the sustainability trend. So that that features there now in our selection. And one thing that we've noticed over the years is that the most successful brands are those that can connect credibly, and the credibly is really important. They can connect credibly to multiple trends. So this is an example from the States, uh, Kodiak Cakes, which is obviously a, a kind of bakery product, but they've expanded beyond bakery into other kind of snack products as well. And they connect um, on a whole platform of, of different trends from better carbs to that they've connected well to the protein trend. They've got some very high protein products there. They um, are very hot on sustainability and connecting to the environment. They produce snack products, which uh, again is, is one of our mega trends. They're very strong on their provenance and authenticity. They've taken into account concerns around real foods and ultra processed foods, which is something that's rapidly moving up uh, the agenda in many markets. Um, and then they're also connecting to digestive wellness and they're doing all of these things really credibly. So you, you never get the impression with Kodiak Cakes that when they talk about any of these trends that it's kind of bolted on as an afterthought. It's kind of baked in to their DNA and that kind of credibility really comes across to consumers and they, they have adopted the brand wholeheartedly. OK, so why is it that some health brands fail? Um, where others succeed. Well, there's a whole range of different reasons. It's something to bear in mind. I wouldn't be scared about it. I know we've got 10 things there, which looks quite intimidating, but they're actually quite kind of logical. So the number one reason that health brands fail in the marketplace is that they don't deliver on taste and texture. They get so caught up in the health benefits that they're delivering or the, the new ingredient that they, they're incorporating that they fail to do that basic thing um, around developing a product that actually tastes um, tastes great and consumers really love. And it's the taste that creates that repeat purchase that leads to success. Number two reason for failure is that the ingredient, the benefit and the product format together don't make sense. So the classic example of that is um, from sort of 10, 15 years ago when omega-3 was really high up everybody's agenda. There was a lot of coverage in the press about it, television programmes and things um, about the, the health benefits of omega-3. Consumers were really interested and really motivated and brands were using omega-3 in almost every kind of product from dairy to juices to bakery products and a lot of those failed because it didn't make sense to the consumer to include a fish oil in a, a yogurt product or a juice product and no matter how good the product tasted there was always this association that there was an ingredient in there that that wasn't right and people perceived that they could taste fish even if you know the encapsulation techniques were so good that 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 actually wasn't the case and th there was a high rate of failure with those those kind of added omega-3 brands so it's just something to be be mindful of Number three, three is that the product re relies too heavily on the health benefits. So if there's no other reason for purchase beyond the health benefit, again, unless you have a, a very strong health motivation to buy that product, it's not really going to succeed with a wider group of, of consumers. Um, so that can be a reason for failure. Number four, it doesn't target the right consumer. Um, this is something that quite often happens with um, the more kind of scientific based products that um, the developers can see that there's a need in terms of the nutrition. There's a nutritional gap in the market, um, say around 
fiber. We all know that we need to eat more fiber, that the UK diet is, is very, very low in fiber. So we assume that that means that people will be motivated to buy products with a, a high concentration of fiber in it. That's not necessarily the case. It's not all about the health benefit for the mass, vast majority of consumers when they're considering a product with fiber in it. Um, so it has to be broader than that. And um, you, generally with health products, you have to start with someone, a group of consumers who are very, very motivated around your benefit and then expand slowly towards the mass market who are not as motivated. Number five, it fails to make connections to, to trends. And we talked there about how important it is to credibly connect to a whole number of trends. If you can't do that, it makes it difficult for your product to succeed. Number six is, is a, <laughs> a board favourite. Um, the, the, the board or the management of the company have impatient and unrealistic sales expectations. So a lot of health type brands can be slow burners. Um, and there's quite a number of um, examples of brands which have been launched into the market and then withdrawn within a year or two because they didn't meet sales expectations. You know, they may have generated 20, 25, 30 million pounds worth of sales in their first year, but that didn't meet the expectations of some of these larger companies. So despite the, the brand itself being a relative success and consumers liking it, it just wasn't succeeding fast enough for management. So it does take a while. Um, number seven, it doesn't deliver a tangible benefit. And this is a, a problem quite often for things around mood and mind and mental health, um, that the benefit that the product delivers is not tangible enough for the consumer to feel it. You can't put high enough dose into your food and drink products. The, the consumer doesn't feel it. They don't believe that the brand's doing what it says it's doing. And so they don't buy it again. Number eight focuses on the technology and not the food consumers. They are interested in how food is made and um, they are interested in the technologies, but not so in interested that they'll do a lot of research and make decisions based on that. There's a whole hierarchy of other things that come first before the technology. So you have to get the taste and the texture and the positioning and the formats, all these things right um, in order for them to pick it up from the shelf. Number nine, it relies on a health claim. Again, consumers very rarely spend a lot of time looking at the labels. Um, it's, it's something that makes product developers really, really sad and marketers really sad because we know how much effort goes into getting that label just right and making that claim, you know, word perfect. But um, a European study, um, which is actually quite old now, but it's been replicated a few times. Um, it actually showed that only 10% of consumers actually even look at the nutrition labels in a product. And those that do are looking at that nutrition label for less than one second. So it really is just looking for a piece of information, like an allergen that they may be concerned about. And once they see that, they don't read the, the rest of the details. So relying on a health claim to do your selling for you is not a good strategy. And then finally, self-explanatory products that are Me Too products find it really difficult to succeed in the marketplace unless they've got something extra to offer. OK, so that was quite depressing, all the, the reasons why your brand might fail. Let's get on to the more positive side now. Um, these are our five mega trends and 10 key trends for 2023. And as you can see, there is a whole range of, of different things there from uh, carbs to mood and mind and real food and UPFs, which are, as I said, are making their way up the, the hierarchy of concern for both consumers and for government organisations. And we do produce this report, our key trends report every year. And because we're looking for trends that stick around for the longer term, things tend to change quite slowly. So the headline trends like digestive wellness don't change that much from year to year. But what does change is what's happening under the bonnet. So there's lots of things going on in digestive wellness. Um, consumers are maybe switching from gluten free to other strategies to deal with digestive wellness. So there's a lot of churn going on under there. Um, so some of the headline things that change since last year's report, real food and the ultra processed food challenge is something that consumers are becoming very aware of. We do a lot of social media listening and looking at, at discussion forums and things. And this is something that consumers, they don't really understand, but they know that it's something that they need to be concerned about because of, you know, recent books that have been published and government discussions and um, 
even mainstream um, news headlines around ultra processed foods and the potential negative impact that they may have on health. So consumers are becoming aware of it. They know they need to do something, but they need your help as manufacturers to help them um, find products that that fit their their lifestyle, that work for them, but are not ultra processed. And as I say, research and government interest is leading to more discussion around these areas, and that will only can continue to increase over the coming years. Um, and in tandem with that, we know that the real food movement is gaining momentum and that's been going on for 20 years, but it's starting to speed up again now because of this concern around ultra processed foods. So definitely something to be aware of. Something else that seems to be coming up the agenda, um, particularly from the States, but you know that things that happen in the States tend to come over here sooner or later. And this are, is um, these concerns around seed oils. So we can see in the US that um, there are a number of influential bloggers and uh, other social media influencers who've kind of raised these kind of concerns over seed oils and what they might be doing for health. And supermarkets seem to be taking that on board. Um, so a list of, of um, supermarkets there that have registered products on the healthy oil register in the US. So we know consumers are more accepting of fats that, than they were historically. But what we're seeing, similar to what happened with carbs, um, is that a hierarchy is starting to develop. So olive oil, butter um, are higher up the hierarchy and seed oils among early adopters. There's starting to be some concerns there. So it's something to bear in mind, particularly when we do produce a lot of very good quality seed oils in this country. So it's good to be um, ahead of the game and have your communication messages around the, the benefits of your particular product ready to go if there's questions asked. We know um, also that there's an increasing focus on value for money for consumers, the cost of living. You know, you can't open a newspaper or go online at all without um, it being very apparent that consumers are, are scared about the cost of living and how that's impacting on their budgets currently and what that might mean for the next six to 12 months. So it's a real primary focus for consumers. And as budgets are being squeezed, indulgent, indulgence and nutrient density are starting to play to consumers' desire for things that are inexpensive treats. So they may not be able to go on holiday, they may not be able to upgrade their car, they may not be able to do, um, you know, even go out for dinner as much as, as they would have done two years ago or three years ago. Um, but what they're still looking for is that kind of inexpensive treat and food and drink products play into that really, really strongly. So we've seen in previous um, times of economic difficulty that actually treat products have done really well because you know, everyone likes a treat at the end of the day. So, yeah, treats are doing well and also har harder working foods. So foods that deliver more bang for their buck, basically. Um, and that can mean that they deliver more health benefits. Um, or they develop, they deliver um, the taste profile or the ease of incorporation into your diet as well as the health benefits. So lots of things going on there. OK, um, so our mega trends, I mentioned we have five of these um, and these really are, it's become apparent, these are the things that you must do as food and drink producers. These are things that consumers expect you to do with every product. Um, so you may not be able to, to generate um, additional revenue or growth based on these mega trends, but you will have questions asked on all of these. So it's, it's really important to kind of consider those in your development. So the first mega trend is around fragmentation. So people's beliefs around food and health and what they eat and what the positives are for them have very, very much fragmented. And that's partly been driven by the sources of information that consumers have around health and nutrition. Whereas historically, you might have gone to um, a GP to discuss health and nutrition or you talk to um, you know, experts in your community, uh, elders in your community about what's good for you and what's bad for you. Nowadays, everyone can find out their own information and they can really um, you know, search online for information that is appropriate to them and that works for them and take that on board. And we can see that having an impact on how people eat. So quite often families are eating, you know, may eat dinner together, but they may all be eating different things around the table because 
someone's got um, issues around gluten, someone's trying to adopt a keto diet to lose weight, other people are trying to incorporate more good fats in their diet. There's lots of things going on. So there's like a, a, a fragmentation of our eating patterns and, and what we're choosing going on there. Um, and that's not just in the UK, that's across the board. And what that means, because people are looking for their own um, information and finding out their own answers, is that beliefs are really fragmenting. So we can see here, these are just an exam some examples of different kind of food products. And you can see that there's um, a confused picture about whether people believe that they're healthy or not healthy. You know, if we'd done this kind of um, survey, in the 2005, for example, more, many, many more people would have said that full fat yogurt was bad for them. We would have been looking at 80, 90 percent of people at that time because there was this kind of real awareness that fat was bad. That picture has changed now. And you can see that it's almost an even split between people who think that full fat yogurt is good for them and people who think it's bad for them. And that goes across the board. Quite often there's an, an age factor at play there. Again, um, older consumers are still more wedded to the idea of, of fat being bad. Younger consumers are kind of changing their views, but that's not a golden rule. It really is a kind of confused picture out there. And it's leading to these kind of situations. So these are both Marks and Spencer's products. They sit side by side on the shelf. Um, both have, as you can see there, the Eat Well logo, so their healthy eating range, but one has 0% fat and one has 10% fat. And they're really tapping into that kind of fragmented view, um, offering a wider range of products to fit, um, to try and pick off these different groups of consumers who believe different things. And again, that's not just in the UK. So I was over in um, Egypt a few months ago and one uh, particular yogurt brand in the Egyptian market has six different fat contents to again, pick off these different groups of consumers. So the same product effectively, but six different levels of fat um, just tapping into these beliefs. So it's a really polarized picture. Our second mega trend is around naturally functional, and this really connects strongly to the idea that real food is better for you and that nature has all the answers. You know, food is nature's medicine sort of thing. Um, and we, it's been behind the success of so many ingredients over the years, from Greek yogurt to turmeric to uh, green tea, um, olive oil, blueberries, all these things um, have that kind of naturally functional benefit. So over and above the basic uh, nutritional portfolio, these products do something extra for you. And that's a really, really powerful message. And it has many advantages. So in terms of NPD, you can use some of these superfood type ingredients either as the core of your product. So you can see those turmeric shots there that basically have turmeric right at the heart. There's a very, very small bottle and it's a really high dose of turmeric. Or it can just be a small inclusion for a halo effect. Um, again, the classic example would be people picking up a blueberry muffin, thinking that that was the healthier choice than a chocolate muffin because it's got blueberries on it despite the fact that the sugar levels may be the same um, or even higher in the blueberry product. Obviously, blueberry, because it's fruit and because of blueberries, that's the healthier choice in many consumers' minds. So we know, number two there, that consumers already understand and they already believe the benefits around natural products. So you really don't have to do that much of a sales and marketing job on um, these products when you're discussing these kind of natural ingredients that they already believe are good for them. The media also love stories around a positive, um, natural, you know, new superfood type story. They're really, really open to these stories. Um, so there's lots of discussion um, in mainstream media and also on, on social media. And finally, no health claims are required because of this idea that consumers already, they already understand the ingredient. They already believe that it's good for them. So you don't actually have to make any specific health claim around that. It's all what they, they already know from their reading online or for, the, for their own set of, of personal beliefs. So it makes life a little bit easier. Our third trend is around well, weight wellness. And we know that weight loss or weight management is the number one health benefit that's sought from food. And that's pretty much consistent over the piece. Weight loss, weight management is always number one and energy um, is always number two um, when it comes to the health benefits. So anything that you can do to tap into that interest that's already there is a really positive 
type of thing. And we know as a result of the pandemic that more people are concerned about their weight than ever before. So 31% of the global population report that they put on weight since the pandemic broke out. The average weight gains 6.1 kilos. Um, and that varies across the world. There's always this concern. Um, but you know, the UK, so 32% in the UK said that they put on weight during the pandemic, 42% in the US gained weight, um, and that's a whopping 13 kilos that they gained weight since the, the pandemic. So there's a lot of online discussion about weight wellness, new diets coming to the fore, um, and consumers are very, very motivated if they think that your product can tap it, help them support those um, ambitions that they have to manage their weight or even reduce their weight. That's again a positive thing. Sustainability, um, I'm sure I don't really need to say very much about sustainability because it's so high in everybody's agenda, but it is really important to notice that there is a large overlap with consumer beliefs around health and those around sustainability. So this was um, a piece of research that was done by the EU. Um, which of the following do you consider to be the most important characteristic of sustainable food? And the number one thing was that it was nutritious and healthy. So there's all, already that connection that sustainable food is better for you, better for the environment, but also better for you as an individual. Um, and quite often you see people making choices that are good for them, but also good for the environment. Uh, generally, the choice for the individual comes first and the environment comes second. But if you can do something to support and um, assuage guilt around that individual choice that people are making, then that's a really, really motiv uh, powerful motivator to purchase. Um, in terms of the people that are most motivated by sustainability and willing to make sacrifices in other areas, it tends to be the lifestylers and early adopters. So they have a deeper understanding of um, what sustainability means and different forms of sustainability, and they're more likely to purchase something because it's sustainable um, than people who fit into the mass market category. Um, so things like uh, carbon neutral status, that's something that really appeals to lifestylers and early adopters, whereas mass market um, consumers are more motivated by packaging because it's something that's, you know, really tangible and they can really see the difference, you know, with in terms of carbon neutral status and tree planting and regenerative agriculture, you kind of have to take that on trust. You really have to trust the brand um, to be able to deliver what they're saying that they're delivering. Whereas with packaging, you can see right away if that can go into the recycling or if it's compostable, then I know that I'm doing a good thing right away and I don't need to, to kind of believe the brand um, based on that. So sustainability broadly is a motivation to purchase in the health active lifestyle segment of the marketplace. So the people who are most motivated by health and packaging is the most effective um, message in mainstream mass market. Um, but currently difficult economic conditions will be the stronger driver of consumer decision making and limit the urge to pay more for a product with sustainability credentials. And that doesn't mean to say sustainability is not an issue for people anymore. But if you can do something, you know, if you can introduce refills, for example, which fits with the um, economic conditions and making life easier and maybe making the purchase slightly cheaper while also um, introducing a sustainability uh, platform, then that's a really, a really good way. Education, also a mega trend. Essentially, that means that consumers like to eat things quite quickly. They don't like a lot of preparation time. And um, even if they know that something is good for them, like, say, beetroot, they're not going to buy lots of raw beetroot and peel it and prepare it. They're looking for you as food and drink manufacturers to prepare that and give that to them in a format that they can they can enjoy really quite quickly. Um, so snacking ought to be part of, of everybody's um, product development kind of plan and making things as, as accessible as possible. So the days of, and we talked about this with, you know, the, the different ways that people are eating and everybody in, around the table is eating different things. So smaller portions, smaller pack sizes, um, no, no longer the kind of big family pack um, being the primary way that you should produce that, that product, but looking at more inventive snack options or on the go options. 
OK, so our key trends. Um, so I mentioned that the mega trends were things that you kind of had to do. Well, the key trends are things that you can do that will really add value if you get them right. So the first one up there is around real food and the ultra processed food challenge. So we know that consumers like real food. That's where the consumer mood is at the moment. Um, and actually avoiding ultra processed foods and choosing real foods are kind of two sides of the same coin. So this idea that consumers are seeking fewer, simpler ingredients, store cupboard ingredients, clean label products, that's a behaviour that's been around for 20 years already. And ultra processed foods are just the next stage in that process. So they sound quite scary. It sounds like some a stick to to beat food manufacturers with, but it's not necessarily that, ca that case. It's just an extension of what's been going on before. Um, and you see an in increase in messaging around the processing of food. So this is Chobani from the US, it's a Greek yogurt brand. And they say on pack, some foods are processed so much, lost nutrients must be added back in. We just use the nutrients nature provides. Um, and that gives consumers reassurance that what they're choosing is real, it's healthy, it's natural, and they don't need to concern themselves with ultra processed foods in that circumstance. One of the big confusions around ultra processed foods is there isn't one legal or regulatory definition of ultra processed foods. Um, it's the media that's really driving that. So there's lots of experts um, who are, you know, using ultra processed foods as a, as a platform these days and talking a lot about it but there isn't one standard definition the nova definition is the one that's been embraced by researchers it's moving towards becoming the standardized definition but it's still quite complex and it's something that consumers don't really understand because they don't know enough about how food is processed you know they don't understand what the difference is between lightly processed and ultra processed because they don't know what goes on in a factory um, so there's definitely an education gap there that that um, provides an opportunity for for brands who are willing to 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 move into that space and start talking about how their food is produced. And we know that consumption of processed foods um, shows a real north south divide, and some of these figures can be quite surprising actually when you first see them. So the UK, 50.7% of the foods that we consume in the UK are ultra processed. Um, Germany, Belgium and Ireland similarly quite high and as you can see in the south of Europe quite a marked difference. So when people talk about the Mediterranean diet quite often what they mean is not necessarily eating more peppers or eating more olive oil, it's about the processing level in, in foods. So not only brands but consumer beliefs also start with early adopters and then evolve into the mainstream. So when a brand is launched it tends to be launched in the kind of early adopter lifestyle consumer space and move slowly into the mainstream um, and that's the same with what people believe. So the term ultra processed foods it might never make it into widespread consumer use um, but you can see already how that hierarchy is looking because we've talked that avoiding um, or rather choosing real foods has been something that's around for 20 years and this is how the consumers in various different parts of the lifestyle cycle um, kind of look are, that they're looking for the messaging that they're looking for and they're motivated by and that they understand so right at, um, in the early adopter space there's a small number of people who are trying to avoid UFPs there's a larger group of people who are looking for messaging around simply processed. And then more in the mass market, it's around looking for fewer and simpler ingredients, um, trying to avoid processed foods. So you'll make um, sacrifices in some categories around processed foods, but there are other categories where you still want to enjoy your favourite foods. So confectionery or bakery or um, ice cream, for example, that people are still quite happy to, to choose a more processed option. And then right at the end of the spectrum, there's those consumers who've never heard of ultra processed foods and they don't care about ultra processed foods and they have so many other priorities in their life that chances are that's never going to be a primary um, concern for them. And actually, this is the kind of great paradox around um, health campaigns, public health campaigns. It's actually that group of consumers that the government really wants to, <laughs> to target and to change the behaviour for but actually they're the ones that are least susceptible to these messages. So quite often these government cam campaigns are already kind of preaching to the choir and they're talking to these lifestylers and early adopters and they never actually reach the consumers that they're actually aiming to target. But five more minutes, is that OK? Yeah, no, I'm zipping through these. Yep. 
Um, so trial number three is plants made con convenient. And there's been a lot of discussion in the media around uh, plant based foods versus animal based foods and how plants were for it seemed for a while they were starting to win that debate based on a sustainability platform, based on a health platform. But the tide is is kind of turning now and the animal products are um, regaining ground with consumers. However, one of the longest term growth trends is around eating more plants. And it's not necessarily about being a vegan or um, converting to a vegetarian diet. It's this knowledge that plants are good for us. We need to try and eat more of them. And the consumers are looking to the industry to come up with products that make that ambition, that goal easier for them. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can do that. Um, there's an example from Bird's Eye there who have done a, a plant-based bake. Um, so this kind of idea from their veggies made easy range, they do all the work, you just heat it up. And that's really quite a motivator, particularly in the mass market. There's a growing interest in botanicals around their health halos. Um, there's a body of science that's making its way into to mainstream media around um, botanicals and the good that they can do. So that's something to watch and maybe incorporate in your products in the future. Um, I mentioned that animal proteins took a bit of bashing over the years and they're starting to fight back. So there is a real kind of reinvention going on with animal proteins just now and it's set for long-term growth, um, largely because animal protein has so many natural advantages. So it's a high quality source of protein um, thinking of eggs or uh, dairy products, for example. It's a very nutrient dense product and um, that's something that's becoming more of a consumer motivator now. Um, it's also familiar and versatile. You don't have to take a risk around some kind of strange lentil protein that maybe your family won't eat um, because they, you, they already understand animal products. They've been eating them for, for such a long time. And we're very familiar with the taste and texture and we like the taste and texture of animal products. And we can see that in terms of sales of, of things like plant-based milks versus dairy milks now. Um, the, the tide is definitely starting to turn on the plant-based um, milk market. In terms of nutrient density, so in 2021 we did this um, consumer survey around health and 12% of consumers in 2021 claimed that they were seeking more nutrient dense foods and that figure jumped to 18% in the space of a year. So nutrient density is really something, I talked about harder working foods being something that people are motivated by during these times of economic difficulty and that nutrient density plays right into that space. So foods that offer lots and lots of nutrient benefits in Quite a small package um, and animal proteins are, are right there. Also things like nuts and seeds um, are, are, are up there but salmon, steak, uh, dairy products, eggs all doing really really well with consumers at the moment and there's a real kind of upsurge of um, social media around this now particularly driven by the fact that nutrient density has been included for the first time in the US dietary guidelines and that's really having a, an impact in the US and we're starting to see it move across here now as well. OK, so key trend number eight is around mood and mind. And we see a lot of coverage in the press around mental health and consumers we know are motivated by things that that can have a positive bearing on their mental health because mental health issues have increased rapidly um, because of COVID, but also because of the, the way that modern society is and the pressures on, on people. So consumers are interested in foods and beverages that can help create a positive influence on their their mood, sharpen the mind um, or help them sleep. And the onus is on companies to help them deliver. So it's a real opportunity. The difficulty around foods for mood and mind is it's difficult to um, create a product that has a high enough dose of something that people can actually feel the benefit of. Um, but there are lots of new and ingredient, interesting ingredients um, coming to the forefront there. CBD was something that peaked kind of a couple of years ago. There are lots of these ingredients coming to the fore that can be incorporated into food and drink. And also there's products like chocolate and wine that people re reach for to, um, to improve their moods anyway. And so there's that, that kind of consumer association already. 
And we know that 26% of consumers are already claiming to be eating foods or choosing foods that, that boost their mood and mental well-being. So there is an opportunity there, but it's not an easy one. Key trend number one is around carbs. Um, so we know that the, there was a real kind of fight back against carbs. That's starting to settle down now, but people are choosing different kinds of carbs, looking for better grains, fewer um, wheat-based products, or if it is wheat-based, then it should be whole grain, looking for green ingredients to incorporate um, to replace some of the, the, the wheat products in foods. So whole grain plus, things like pastas made with vegetables, snacks made with vegetables, again, tapping into that need to eat more um, plants. And successful brands that link to multiple trends like Kodiak Cakes um, also include things like keto and tap into that, that kind of low carb um, eating pattern for weight wellness. And fat links very strongly into that. So while carbs are going down, particularly sugar and wheat, um, in terms of consumers' interest in them, fat is increasing and um, consumers are much more motivated to consume healthy fats now. Um, so there are many reasons why consumers like full fat products and as product developers, it's really quite a good thing to include in the product. It helps with taste and texture. It sometimes means that you can have fewer ingredients included in the product. Um, you can offer lower sugar products than general low fat options. It fits into lots of weight management strategies, this idea of eating healthy fats um, low carb, high fat or low calorie, high fat diets. Um, and again, they're more natural and less processed. So it taps into that um, ultra processed foods or real foods paradigm. And three different strategies there that you can see. Um, we've got lots and lots of information on that. I'm only touching on the headlines today. But if you're interested in any of these strategies, please give me a shout and I can send you more information after today. Digestive wellness, um, which was a real kind of engine powerhouse of the nutrition health um, trends over the last few years, very much fragmented, very much um, diversified into lots of different things. Consumers are just as motivated as they've ever been to improve their digestive wellness. We know that about one third of people at any one time are suffering from digestive discomfort, so it's quite a stable marketplace. People um, are, are looking for solutions to that. And digestive is one of these things where you feel right away if something is working for you, you know, you get an immediate impact. And that's a really, really positive message, a really kind of motivating message for consumers. And it's why people come back to digestive more and more uh, over and over again. What we're seeing now is Digestive Plus coming out in the marketplace because there's so many choices around digestive wellness that people can pick and choose. Um, so we're seeing digestive plus mood benefits because of the gut um, brain access. We're seeing digestive um, protein. We're seeing digestive energy. So lots of double benefits coming out in that area. And again, that plays into that uh, consumer urge for products that are working harder for your money. So that was all that I had to say today. I know that there was a lot of information there. I'm more than happy to take questions or if you want to contact me after the, pre the presentation, my email address is there. I'm more than happy to pro provide extra information if required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aileen. Uh, fascinating as always. I really, really found that really interesting. So thank you. And I hope that the audience found that interesting as well and they can take some of that thinking into what new products they're going to develop in the future. Um, so now I'll pass on to our next speaker, which is Fiona from Aquascot. And she's going to talk about the process they go through for developing new products for, for weight shows and mm -hmm. for the consumer. So uh, over to you, Fiona, if you want to share your screen. So... My name is Fiona. I work in um, a company called Aquascot. We're based in Allness in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and I'm just going to talk you through our new product development process and sort of working with um, a major retailer and some of the, the things that we need to consider. But also just a little bit of, of the key stages and some considerations of NPG and NPD sorry, in, in general um, for uh, those of you that will find that interesting. Um, so, sorry, apologies, doesn't want to, there we are. 
So a quick business overview on Aquascot. So um, we are producers of Scottish salmon and Scottish trout. We're not fish farmers, um, but we do um, process and manufacture um, salmon and Scottish trout products in both a plain format and in an added value format. Um, and we're a 100% employee owned business, which is, um, as you'll see later, kind of ties in with our, our um, major customer. So that works really quite well for us. Um, so we are all known as partners within our business. Um, we produce plain fish, as I mentioned, and also added value fish, and that's from our two production sites, both of which are in Allness, north of Inverness. We've had a 20 year plus partnership with Waitrose, so that sort of ties in back with that employee owned um, side of things. Uh, we've got about 180 partners and about 40 million, 45 million pounds turnover. We've been a partner of Waitrose um, and have worked with them since about 2003, but it, our relationship does go back further than that, but we've been a Waitrose only dedicated site um, since that time. So just an oversight into some of our products. So we um, have 35 different product lines into Waitrose. They cover their um, fish service counters and they're probably one of the few, if not the only major multiple now that has um, a, a fish counter or a service counter, they sometimes call it. And we provide things right from whole, whole gutted salmon through to salmon sides, through to um, marinated portions, through to um, all crudes. So, so straight from the sort of like almost the, the, the real raw material, so to speak, through to the added value side of it. We also produce your what I what I call two bits of fish in a in a tray. So um your what we call pre-packed natural fish. So that's trout, organic salmon, um and um standard Scottish salmon. And then tied into um the sort of more ovenable ready straight to oven type products. So we have a number of added value lines. Um, so you can see here, so we do mini burgers, we do marinated salmon fillets, we do more pastry style products um, on crudes. We do some fish cakes, although they're a bit more sort of artisanal than your bog standard bread crumbed fish cake that you might pick up in the retailers. We do kebabs, we've got frozen products, meatballs, and we've also got some entertaining products which are ready for the customer to order um, from, from Waitrose. So many of you on this call will already know, but I, I like to just kind of try and put NPD into my own words. So for me, it's the process of designing and creating a product using a series of critical steps to, to bring it to market, also known as a critical path, which is sometimes the, the bane of my life. Um, so really just around the, the key stages for a, a product development process, and we still do this, it doesn't matter if you're a small business or a, a you know, or a large larger business dealing with the major multiples, the, the steps and the fundamentals are, are still the same. They're just adopted to a lesser or a greater degree, um, depending on your, your ultimate customer. Um, so from a concept stage, you know, we've got the ideas, we're having our light bulb moments, who's the target market, filtering that, um, those ideas, and then also benchmarking um, your product or your ideas against what's out there and getting onto the, the creation. And then, um, especially critical for us, for our business, is, is around the scaling up. So taking what you've made in your, your, your home kitchen, possibly, or your um, development kitchen, and scaling that up into um, something that is financially viable, will work in transport, um, and ultimately works from a product point of view. Um, it, it's not always easy to scale up from a kitchen sample and into a factory sample. Um, some businesses I've worked worked in in the past, you know, we were dealing with bowl choppers in the kitchen of one, two kilos up to 150, 250 kilos in a massive bowl chopper for a Christmas deli line, for example. So things like terrines and mousses and canapes. Um, we're not we're not quite uh, at that level here. Um, but I'd be looking probably to scale up from something like 500 grams or a kilo in the kitchen to something like probably 60 kilos in a batch in the factory. And then lastly, and the bit that takes a long time to get to really, the approval process. Uh, obviously ours is with Waitrose um, and that will differ again, depending on 
you know, where you're going to sell your products into. Um, but that's all around how you're going to sell them in, the logistics, et cetera, et cetera, and getting that to market. So the next a couple of slides really are just a little bit of things to consider at each stage. So product design, and um, we're thinking about the idea generations, refining and, and designing that ultimate recipe, knowing your product inside and out, and especially if you're a small business, um, you are going to be the expert on that product. Um, and then engaging with your local authorities, so your environmental health. So at that point, really thinking about branding, what about the design? How will you um, get consumers appeal for your product and how will you stand out from the crowd? And crucial to that is the next stage really is, is about the competition. So what is everyone else doing? Um, so you're you know being able to benchmark yourselves to the competition. We do that on a sort of formal basis and we share those information um, and research with Waitrose. It doesn't have to be that formal. You know, you might just be buying in um, other things that you see at a farmer's market, you know, but what, what do your competitors do well? And can you learn anything from that from your product or your, your marketing or your packaging? And what do you feel that your competitors don't do so, so well? And what price points, what pack weights, what formats? And, and actually taste testing, if that's an applicable thing. Um, but what sets you apart from the crowd and what's going to be your USP, your selling point? So customers and target markets is going to be absolutely immensely diverse. Our, ours obviously is into weight rows, so ours is a retail market. Um, but within that, we know that the, the weight row shopper tends to be someone who's older. They tend to be more affluent. Um, so we, we would be developing products in, with a slightly different mindset um, around perhaps customers' budget and customer needs and customer skill set potentially than we might do if we were um, developing products for a different retailer. But there are lots of retail selling platforms. So you've got directly or face-to-face -face online website. Much of these are, are more appropriate for smaller businesses. Um, online social media, independent shops, wholesale, large retailers. So lots of different target markets in terms of the final consumer and where they can buy your, your product. So scaling up now the manufacturer. So um, can your sorry, um, can your product be repeated time after time, whether that's in the kitchen or in the factory, and will it remain consistent? Obviously, you want customers to be satisfied with your product, whether they buy it the first time on day of launch or several weeks, months, and ideally um, years later. So I talked briefly about recipe scaling up. It can definitely cause issues. Um, you know, some ingredients won't necessarily directly scale up percentage by percentage. So you might need to, to adapt your recipe slightly to accommodate that. Thinking about traceability and batch coding, record keeping. Uh, obviously, in, in large businesses, that's something that's just sort of parcel and parcel. But if you're a smaller business starting out, you know, this is all that's all going to be new. And what do you need and how do you how do you know what records you need to keep? And that's something we've been sort of talking about um, at the Tech Hub. You don't know what you don't know until you need to know. Um, how will you sort of test the quality and sample and what paperwork's involved with that? Do you need to buy any equipment? Packaging, your packaging needs to be fit for, for purpose. It needs to keep the food safe. Um, it needs to be fit for purpose from a logistics point of view. And then there are the sustainability um, elements to consider as well. But again, um, there's no point in having a packaging that is, for example, compostable if, if your product's not going to be functional or um, fit for purpose and food safe within that. And then also logistics, so your distribution chain, how will you get it to the customer? Because that will impact on, on perhaps what packaging format you need to adopt. Um, and for us in a larger business, again, you know, we need to conduct formal travel tests. Um, we, we need to send down samples and then our retailer will evaluate them at, um, at depot and in store and make sure that product actually survives through in transit. That's all right, mostly for us, because we're dealing with something that's it's pretty robust. But if you're manufacturing a bakery product or a cake product, you know, something that's much more fragile, then that's going to even going to have a, a much bigger impact on your products. Um, 
So tied in with the manufacture, obviously, we're talking about things that, that are related to food safety, so allergens. Um, determining shelf life and what makes your product safe, how will you prove that that, that your product is safe? Um, how do you, you, you know, how do you go about that? Again, you don't know what you don't know. Um, will it be a used by or a best before? Again, determining that. Organoleptic, so evaluating your product through its through its anticipated shelf life. Does it change? Is it still acceptable? What shelf life um, should you really give it from, from a taste and quality taste um, perception point of view? Um, nutrition, so are you going to make any claims on your product? High protein, source of protein, low fat, high in omega-3, could be um, lots of different things that you might want to make a claim on. And it's knowing that if you're making a claim, you need to be able to substantiate that and have the evidence to back that up. Product labelling, legislation, um, marketing messages, you know, ultimately your product needs to be legal um, and, and you need to understand or have advice and guidance on what that um, label needs to say. And then expert and external resources. So often, especially in, in smaller companies, but also in larger companies, we need help and support from external sources um, for us. That might be a specific scientific question that we perhaps um, go back to a, um, a, an institution like Camden and Charlywood Food Research Association, Leatherhead. Um, you know, we um, we actually have to send our raw product off for cooking instruction. We have to send that to an, an accredited laboratory and they will verify our cooking instructions. So, um, as I said, it, it very much depends on on your ultimate end customer, not your consumer, but your customer, um, as to what sort of level um, of expert and external resource you need. But that's something that certainly um, Alistair has talked about and, you know, the tech hub um, and higher in, involved in um, looking to support that. Costings, um, it sounds a bit obvious, but if you, if your product's not going to make money then there's little really point in doing it and um, ultimately um new products obviously take a little bit of time to bed in but there's certain obviously there's certain things that you need to consider around around what to involve in your costings and including your costings so labor packaging ingredients storage and energy transport um that's quite a tricky one sometimes depending on where you're actually based and can be really really challenging for manufacturers and small businesses Advertising, marketing, trade fairs and shows, so what are you going to get involved in? Are you going to go to things like the, the Royal Highland Show, market your products? And beware of the hidden costs, so especially for smaller businesses, you know, you might not be aware that perhaps if you're creating bespoke pieces of packaging for yourself that you might need to um, have minimum order quantities. There might be a generation cost involved in that. And then also things like verifying nutritionals or doing um, shelf life and microbiological testing. So it's all these are all things that you will have to spend money on potentially to prove that your product is safe. So getting products listed can take a, a really long time um, and, and more so probably for a smaller business that is, you know, where, where it's a, a one man band, so to speak, where you're you're trying to do everything. You're, you're the accountant, the manufacturer, the um, the salesperson. Um, so where are you going to sell sell your products and, and justifying why your product would be stocked? Um, you know, looking into trade fairs, food shows, local events, um, and having the opportunity perhaps to meet supermarkets. You know, a lot of the supermarkets do, like for example, a sort of Scottish supplier um, events, trade retail buyers, regional buyers for the big supermarkets as well. Um, you know, I certainly I know that Asda and the co-op definitely do that, and I think Morrison's too. Um, and I've already mentioned, you know, the Royal Highland Show. So just putting yourself in places where you might um, be able to pitch your product. And then online platforms are a great test bed for MPD, and I think that that definitely um, came to light during the lock, lockdown period. Absolutely. There were so many small businesses that were springing up there. Um, So I've just got a, a, a quick sort of case study, really, that, that shows um, the steps that we went through for a recent 
wait for those NPD line. So this is the wait for those um, summer range barbecue or and this is our, the Aquascots um, teriyaki salmon kebabs. So the first thing really that, that we look at, and this is this is not just necessarily bespoke to this product, but we're always interested and, and we'll research the food trends. So, you know, what the, again, back back to the competition, what are the competitors doing? What prices are they at? How does it taste? Um, what flavor trends are they following? What, what are the restaurants doing? So we do quite a lot of research, both internally and with external um, bodies to create a summary of food trends and key flavours. So that's really going on in the background all the time. The next step really for us was that Waitrose um, issued an NPD brief. So they basically, this is where they're asking us to come up with some concept ideas for a specific range. And in this case, it was barbecue. And um, we're also working on Christmas, various other things. Um, so they've asked us for barbecue concept ideas. And we know that we could make a kebab and we know that we've got some byproduct that we could make the kebab with so all this all these sort of little pieces of the jigsaw are all sort of falling into play for us so we're starting to think here about like what what we know what they've asked for and um, they're looking for a salmon or a trout product so a pink fish product in their barbecue range and internally we're thinking about like what what raw material do we have? What might give us the best commercial um, opportunities, both for them and then obviously our business needs to make um, some money out of these products too. So that's where it's, it's a little bit of a mix in pot at that point. Lots of people having their input um, around what we might look to develop. So from the product development brief that we've had from Waitrose, which obviously has quite a bit of background in it, they also have their um, you know, their consumer information that they are looking to target with any specific ranges. But from this, we start to have a look at the Japanese products in the market. And, that can, and, and we don't always look at, in fact, we seldom always look at fish. We look right across the way. So, you know, we're looking at things like, for example, in Waitrose, in their frozen category, they're now doing flavoured butters, which are new, but they're doing a miso butter. So that's, you know, that's a Japanese trend. You've got all those, the wagamama, the itsu, um, and then eventually we sort of start to have a look at some of the specific flavours in that and things that might work with our raw materials. So we sort of settle um, on the Japanese cuisine trend. We think that's probably a good fit for us. So we've rationalised the ideas down as a team, an NPD team. Um, and from research, we know that nearly 90% of customers are looking for a bit more help and a bit more convenience with Asian dishes. And with that in mind, that's sort of why we embrace the Japanese trend. Um, and we know that our products need to be oven stroke barbecue, <laughs> definitely in Scotland, oven stroke barbecue ready. So that's when we started to, so point five really, we're starting to go along the Japanese kind of theme. Um, and we, went for something that we felt would probably be best suited with salmon and that was a rich soy teriyaki marinade and then what we decided was that actually probably a fish kebab would a salmon kebab with a teriyaki marinade would probably work so chef looked at lots of different recipes and formats for the kebab in the kitchen we went from pieces of salmon to to um you know small portions of salmon on skewers um, and at that point, you know, we're we're starting to think about how would this be presented in the pack um, and refining some of that that recipe. So that's all through stage six, where chefs working in the kitchen and we are tasting all manner of different um, recipes mocked up in the kitchen. We get the wider team to come and taste stuff. But at this point, we're also thinking about allergens and um Primarily for this, because generally, if, if you went to a restaurant and you ordered, say, for example, a, a teriyaki salmon, chances are that it will come and it will have fresh, angle cut um, spring onions on top, and it'll also have sesame seeds. And we're a nut free and sesame seed free site, so that's been bombed out. So, what are we going to garnish ours with if we're going to garnish it at all? And then also, we, we discovered through this process that 
honey doesn't always behave um it doesn't always play nice in recipes especially recipes that have starch so we actually swapped um honey which we probably would have used because it was a standard ingredient for us we swapped it for agave syrup um because it was much more stable and it allowed the starch that we needed to be functional within our recipe for the marinade to actually functional. Um, it wasn't being broken down by the agave syrup like it was by the honey. And through that then, so next stage, so that's all about the research, ingredient research and costings, and we had to then go and source this agave syrup and what were the minimum order quantities and what impact was that going to have on the costings. So we worked through all of that. And then internally, we finalised what the recipe was was going to be and what, what we were going to um, show to it. We did show some other products and concepts as well. Um, and then stage nine, so we're now at the submission stage. So we're down at Waitrose and we're taking the product and we're showing it to their fish team. So that would involve um, someone from their technical department, someone from their commercial department, so the fish buyer, and also the product developer. So that's my, what I call one-to-one -one person. And then stage 10 is all about the feedbacks and the comments. And, and ordinarily, you would have several stages of, well, could you up the salt? Could you down that? It's a bit, you know, um, it needs to be sweeter. It needs to be less sweet um, on the marinade. But on this occasion, we kind of struck gold. So the, the fish team really liked it. And they didn't ask us to make any amends to the recipe or to the pack weight. So what we ended up with was four teriyaki kebabs in a tray garnished with fresh chopped coriander. And then the next stage from that, so having gone from what I call the trio, so the developer, the technical person and the commercial person, we then have to submit to the Waitrose wider exec team for a brand panel. And that's where they all get together and they will decide if that product will be um, put forward for, for launch or not. So it launched. So yes, it obviously got brand panel approval. But again, at brand panel, they they can and, and do come back and say, well, actually, you know, too much garlic, not enough garlic. Or, well, actually, we don't, we want spring onions as a garnish. We don't want coriander as a garnish. So there's still an opportunity there for weight weight was to buy in, so to speak, to that concept or not. Um, but they did buy into it. And then we basically progress with our critical path um, to launch. And then ultimately, this is what we end up with. So four teriyaki salmon kebabs, and then um, the online image, and then the final artwork. And the artwork is, is for us, the, the photography and everything is done by Waitrose, but we create a document through the online specification system. Again, something that's generally just more characteristic of, of a bigger retailer. And um, that creates what's called a pack copy. And the pack copy effectively is everything that needs to go onto the artwork. So everything that needs to make that um, packaging legal. So down to, um, you know, the, the marketing text on the front, the tender of salmon kebabs, you know, that's a kind of like the flowery foodie speak. But then on the back, you've got your legal title, which, you know, um, as the name suggests, has to be legal. Um, we've got some nutritional claims on there. So as I mentioned before, um, if you're making the nutritional claims, you know, you need to be able to back, back that up and continue to do so over a period of time. So we declare our product, our salmon products as high in omega-3. And um, we declare them as a source of protein. We probably could declare them as high in protein, but because it's you get variability, we, we generally sort of stick to the safe side on the source of protein because it sits right on the cusp. Our ingredient declaration, um, allergy advice, obviously absolutely crucial. How the customer is going to prepare it and, and cook it. Again, we, we do that work internally, but we send that away to be verified. So um, we just know that that's been double checked, so to speak. Our nutrition analysis, again, we send that away to be verified. Some other large businesses will have facilities to do that in, internally. How does the customer store it? Can it be frozen? Any any warning? So that might be bones or scales or shell or whatever, depending on, on a product. Um, and then some um, packaging recycling information and then the legal bit about it's responsibly so sourced, um, it's, it's farmed salmon, et cetera, et cetera. And our um, health mark. 
so that's that's pretty much me. Um, a whistle stop tour of what we do for Waitrose um, and a little bit just generally on the MPD process. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was great. Um, it's great to see the the, pro the process you go through for product development and hopefully there's a number of, of things there that can be replicated by the small businesses that are that are involved in the Tech Hub project and the businesses that are on the call today. So, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we had hoped to again get the get the other take on new product development from from a small business, a farm farm owner who had developed some products using uh, goat milk, uh, developed some cheeses that they sold locally through uh, through local farmers markets and so forth. But unfortunately, Teddy from Highland uh, House of Highland, sorry, uh, had a family emergency, so just just pulled out just before we started. So. But hopefully there is enough things from there and from Fiona's presentation that the, the smaller businesses on the call can, can make use of it and, and replicate in their own in their own process. So so thank you very much for that. Uh, so we'll, ju we'll just move on to, to the final presentation and then there'll be time for, for question and answers after after the three presenters are finished. So I'll now uh, pass on to, to Sarah Wilkie from Queen Margaret University, who's going to talk more about the science of food formulation. Um, so yeah, I'll just pass over to you, Sarah, and please uh, please share your screen. So thank you. Hi there, happy to be here today. Um, very very exciting. Okay, so hi everyone. I am Sarah Wilkie. I am from the Scottish Centre for Food Development and Innovation. We are based here at Queen Margaret University, um, just outside Edinburgh. If you haven't heard about us before, um, we are a team of product developers, sensory scientists, nutritionists food scientists, that sort of thing. Um, and we help a lot of small businesses, but then also larger businesses with um, product development and consumer testing as well. So the product life cycle um, of a new product um, kind of goes in this this stage. So um, it's, it's never really a once and done um, process. It's kind of, you always need to do little tweaks um, to, to certain things as time goes on. So um, sorry if that burst your bubble a bit, if you've got the perfect product and you're like, oh, well, that's it for, for years and years. Sadly, it will probably have to, to change slightly, um, but everyone's completely different and every product's completely different. So redevelopment could be for a number of reasons. Um, so legislation can change. Um, so the government, the FSA, can put in different legislation. That means that you have to reduce things or um, change things slightly. Also, if you want to increase your shelf life, you might have to redevelop your product slightly. Um, some retailers want X amount of days on a product, um, so you might have to change it to, to be fitting in that to get another listing or, or so on. Also, if you're upscaling a product, so um, as Fiona said, um, when you're taking it from a small batch to a manufacturing, it can need slight tweaks and adjustments, um, and sometimes that involves um, a full redevelopment or, or just little tweaks here and there. Also, you might want to reduce your amount of allergens in your product. Um, quite a lot of food companies do kind of are rethinking the amount of allergens in their products because that's a massive um, buzzword just now and people are, um, there's lots more people so with, with allergy, food allergies now than there ever has been. Um, next is consumer trends. So um, as Aileen said, like things are changing, are ever changing, um, new trends come in, you want to keep up with competitors, that sort of thing. Also, that's kind of where sustainability is kind of coming in. So if you want to hit a certain sustainability claim or anything like that, um, you want to keep up with it. Um, so you might want to change your ingredients from ingredients that are from Australia to ingredients that are from the EU to make it um, reduce your ear mails for that product. Um, next one, if an ingredient becomes unavailable, so sometimes um, a supplier can say we no longer supply that ingredient, sorry, and that's just that you're left in the complete lurch and you have to find a new solution. So it's always good to be aware of what other ingredients are out there and um, that are similar to the one that you currently have in your product just to know if that one wasn't available anymore you can go somewhere else and and you might need to to tweak it slightly um because every ingredient is slightly different the next one is health so if you want to um, increase fiber increase protein reduce um 
back sugar salt, anything like that, um, it's a massive redevelopment um, things and there's many challenges uh, that come along with that, which I will be going into. Um, and lastly, it's to reduce the cost. So um, as we're all aware, the economic crisis is among us and um, we, um, you're constantly maybe looking at ways to reduce the cost of a product. So um, kind of it goes along with suppliers, a supplier of ingredient could completely bump up their cost for, for your ingredient and your, your, it's just simply not viable to, to have that ingredient in your product anymore. So you have to look at other options and to try and reduce your cost. So um, because of all these reasons, I think it's quite important for small businesses, but also large businesses um, to understand the functionality of your ingredients. And this is simply the reason why that ingredient is in your product. So it's really, really good to know from your ingredients list, you understand absolutely every, every ingredient and what that brings to your product and why it's there. Um, and this is quite a, a challenging thing to understand, but I'm going to give you a few tips on, on how to do that. So once you understand everything, it will actually really help you overcome certain challenges with new or existing products. So um, it will save you time, it will save you money, it will save you wasting any product um, during the development stage. Um, you won't obviously have any more food waste. If you can change things quickly and easily, um, that will help. Also your supply chain. So obviously if ingredients are no longer available, you want to keep your supply chain going. You don't want to, you don't want to let down a, a retailer that you've just got a listing for because you can't get ingredients. So um, massive, massive logistical, logistical things with your supply chain. And lastly, just to know your ingredients and what ingredients you as a brand want to put into your product. Um, and just knowing what you can switch out um, if there is any, any issues. So Knowing all of this will kind of help you overcome challenges that will um, sadly come um, at some point in the stage. So changing the formulation of anything can impact um, these four things. So the shelf life, the sensorial aspects of your, your product, um, the product cost and the manufacturing. So the methodology for the manufacturing. Um, today I'm going to mostly be talking about shelf life and um, the sensorial aspects um, of your product, um, but the other two ones are applicable all the time basically um, as I go through the next part. So if we just think about the nutritional makeup of your product, this um, pie chart is is all equal quantities, which never ever happens, but um, it's just to show you the principle of if everything was equal um, and you wanted to reduce the, the saturated fat, as an example, you have to keep in mind that if you change it, so that's been changed by half, everything else has to increase. So you have to understand that if you reduce that, then your sugar might be going um, from a, a green um, traffic light to an amber traffic light. So you have to be aware that you're changing, everything's kind of a fine balance of, of changing and tweaking. Um, also, um, the, the protein content and the fibre content will go up then, um, which are, make the product much more dry, that sort of thing. So all these things to consider, and this was just a little demonstration of slight tweaks can really impact um, your nutrition. And I would highly recommend you just doing um, calculations to to work out exactly what if you change this what impact that has on all the other nutritional aspects of your product so today uh, i'm going to speak to you very broadly um through the functionality of these three um products these are hot topics just now um fat sugar and salt so the hfss um guidelines and um, that are set out by the government has now been pushed back to 2025 but some supermarkets are still going to head with it so and it's also i think consumers are a bit more aware of fat sugar and salt um on a different product so um if you wanted to create a hfss compliant product you have to be aware that you're reducing these three um ingredients in your product um these are just going to be broad functionalities every functionality will be specific for each product um, so I'm just doing this in very broad terms, um, just to, to preface it, because some might not be applicable to your product 
um, what some people they are. OK, so first of all, we're going to go through fat. So fat creates that lovely, lovely, luxurious, thick mouthfeel that we all know and love. Um, and also um, along with like mouthfeel is in, is in texture. Um, so it is also good for pastries. So obviously butter and pastries is incremental. Um, so you need to consider how you're going to replace that mouthfeel. Um, and there are some smart ingredients out there um, that can replace that um, mouthfeel of fat. Next is um, fat creates this long lasting aftertaste. Um, so right now, if I gave you strawberry sorbet and strawberry ice cream and, I, and they were the exact same strawberry level, absolutely the same. And I asked you to um, write down which one had the long, more, more long lasting aftertaste, it would be the ice cream because the ice cream has fat in it. So it really coats the mouth and it stays in the mouth for much longer. So you will have to consider how you're going to create that long lasting um, taste if you were reducing the fat or taking away the fat completely. Um, so there is little little tricks um, to, to do that sort of thing. Next is shelf life. So fat um, keeps in the moisture um, in food products, so it stops it from going off um, as quickly. You really do have to consider how you're going to attain that shelf life without the fat being there. Um, and again, there's um, additives and stuff that will help um, uh, maintain the shelf life, but it's something to consider if you are if you are replacing it. Next is fat soluble vitamins. So um, vitamins A, D, E and K um, are all fat soluble. So they only exist in fat. <laughs> um, that's the only way you can get them. So you have to consider, right, if I take away the fat, how am I going to achieve these vitamins? Um, so you have to consider that maybe you won't have a vitamin claim or anything like that um, on your product if you are reducing it. Next is glazing. So um, you, fat creates that really nice glaze on products. Um, so you really have to consider how you're going to create that glaze, glazed effect um, in sauces and a lovely bechamel sauce, lovely glaze on it. So you have to consider how you're going to replicate that. Um, next is, see it, because the team's things there, is flavour. So during my um, studies, I um, actually was part of a team that um, was able to prove that we can detect fat on our tongue. So um, without, with all other things masked, you can still detect fat on your tongue. So it's technically now going to be the, the sixth um, sense, the sixth taste on your tongue, sorry. Um, so uh, People have then different preferences for fattiness and that sort of thing. Um, and we all love that that fatty flavour. So how are you going to replicate that in um, a pastry or a, I can't even think of any fatty products or a, um, a deep fried product or anything like that. So you really do have to consider that that fatty taste is well known and well, um, well liked. So how are you going to replace that or, um, or um, change the, the flavour profile to adapt to it? Next is sugar. So sugar obviously provides sweetness um, to products. Um, for quite a while, there's been artificial and natural sweeteners out there um, which are quite effective at um, replacing um, sugar. But you do have to consider that the next point is um, sugar is actually a bulking agent. So it creates a texture in your mouth. So it's how are you going to create that texture? Because we've mimicked the sweetness absolutely fine at that, how are we going to mimic the texture in your mouth? And you might actually have to use a couple of ingredients. Maybe you use a sweetener to replace the, the, the sweetness, but then you have to use a gum or something like that to replace the, the, the texture that sugar provides in, in drinks, for example. Next is colour. So the um, sugar um, impacts the colour in many ways because it, um, it it's essential for the a thing called the Maillard reaction, um, and that's the browning kind of golden effect that we get on pastry goods. So if you're re reducing the sugar, you might ha actually have a paler product. So how are you going to replicate the 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 sugar um, colouring? So you might have to think about natural or artificial colourings in that um, instance. So lots of things to consider if you're you're tweaking and reducing. But these are all thing good things to to understand. 
because then when you're developing, you're like, ah, OK, that makes sense. So if I do that, then this is going to happen. And it just saves time and effort, doesn't it? Um, next is shelf life. So sugar stops um, microbial growth um, in the products. So you have to consider how you're going to attain that shelf life again, um, re reduce or replace the sugar. Next is fermentation. So sugar is very, very important um, in fermented products. So right now a, buzz, a buzzword is kombucha. So uh, I don't know if anyone's ever tried kombucha, but um, not my cup of tea, to be honest. But um, it's a fermented product that utilizes sugar. So the, the yeast um, eats away at the sugar because it needs it um, to grow. And then it creates this kind of acidic um, taste, but the sugar is still there. So sometimes they actually add in, once the fermentation has taken place, they sometimes add in a little bit of sweetness. Because when you're drinking a drink, you normally think about sugar and you normally want it to be sweet. So um, that's why they add in the sugar at the end to give it that, that sweet profile. Um, which leads me on to my last um, point for sugar is flavour. So if you have, say, a, a berry um, fruit drink, the berry flavour will actually be um, increased and maintained because of the sugar. So if you wanted to reduce the sugar or um, take it out completely, you have to consider that the flavour profile might not be exact and you might actually have to increase the flavouring or the amount of fruit um, that's in it because the sugar um, isn't there to boost it, um, which could then be costly um, uh, because you need to add in more of an ingredient that's um, more expensive than, than sugar. The um, next point is salt. So the functionality of salt, um, the main actually one is shelf life. Shelf life is really um, Microbes really hate salt, so um, salt helps maintain the shelf life and get you a long, longer lasting shelf life. So you have to consider that you don't have that. You might have to sacrifice um, a few months of shelf life, as an example. Next is colour. So um, salt creates um, a, a kind of goldeny colour as well um, on bakery goods. Um, next is flavour. So salt um, is something we all are very, very um, accustomed to and love. Um, and there are some salt replacers um, on the market, which are really great. They are lower in sodium. So I think potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, um, these are all um, great salts, but you have to consider that you could maybe get a slight metallic aftertaste with some of these salts. So you might have to consider how you're going to mask that if it exists. But just be aware that these little things could um, could create slight aftertastes um, and you might have to um, put flavour masks or flavour maskers um, in your in your product to to take away these these metallic um, off taints. Um, but they are really good at replacing salt and sometimes you can actually replace them like for like or you can actually replace them. You can put in a lower amount of of the, um, the salt replacers. Um, so not sodium chloride, potassium chloride, you can actually use less of it, um, which is useful as well. Next one is texture. So salt creates that lovely fluffy, fluffy texture in cakes, um, and it's really incremental in, in bread as well, which I'm going to go on to. Um, so you have to consider, right, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to use as much salt. I want to reduce that. We may have to put in more um, bicarbonate soda, that sort of thing, which has salt in it as well. But <laughs> um, you need to consider your levels if you want to have a, a reduced salt claim on pack. Um, next one is fermentation. So salt is vital in the fermentation of bread. Um, and the um, bread industry has actually been encouraged to reduce the amount of salt in their products over the last 20 to 30 years. So it used to be about 2, 2.5% salt in bread. And if I gave you that now, you would hate it because it's not, we've, they've gradually, gradually, gradually reduced the salt in bread. That's how they've decided to do it. So they reduce it a little tiny bit, um, probably every year. Um, that, so that consumers don't notice the difference. Um, so now it's, it's actually close to 1% um, salt in bread. 
Um, and if we all tasted it just now, we would literally think it was the saltiest thing on earth. But because we're grown accustomed to it and um, the consumers are all are all accustomed and our taste buds are accustomed to it, um, we won't we don't notice the difference um, gradually. It was the same actually with um, Heinz beans. They slowly were reducing the salt um, and the sugar just to keep in with um, legal guidance from um, the FSA. The last point is curing. So salt um, is incremental in curing um, bacon and um, salmon, that sort of thing. And um, we're constantly being encouraged to reduce um, the, the amount of salts that are used in curing. Um, and there's not much to say about that because it is a massive challenge um, and there's the salt replacers can't really do the same as sodium chloride. So it is a massive functionality and you can maybe reduce a certain percentage, but um, it is quite incremental in, in the curing process. So up on screen just now is a uh, ingredients list for a commercial sponge cake premix. So this um, product is actually given um, is bought by the food service um, industry um, to create a lovely Victoria sponge um, just quickly and easily. So all you need to do, this is this comes in a powder form. All you need to do is add water to it and mix it together and then it gives you you bake it and then it creates this gorgeous um, Victoria sponge that you can see on the side there. Um, so all of these kind of reasoning for, for putting this up was all of these ingredients are all there for a specific reason. Um, each one is there to create the gorgeous appearance, that brown and um, golden colour and to create the, the fluffy light texture, to create the flavour profile and um, to create to to be there as a convenience product for the food for the food service uh, industry, because you simply just need to add water to it. So all these ingredients are there to create um, time and time again this perfect uh, Victoria sponge cake. Um, so when you're maybe looking at um, your ingredients list or a competitor's ingredients list, just kind of dissect it and just look, um, right, okay, they've got this raising agent in it. Why have they got that? What's that for? What's What does this do? Um, and really just kind of question everything. Um, because you don't, you don't even need to add eggs to this um, premix. So um, everything is literally in there, which is also, it's just part of the convenience of the product. And you have to think about the convenience maybe of your product and what you are maybe asking the consumer to do with your product um, if it requires additional steps. Um, and also they're used potentially because um, of Cost um, the the Victoria sponge. I, I didn't actually look at the price of this, but it will be relatively um, low cost um, for the end consumer. So then they can for the food service consumer. So, so then they can sell it up um, for a larger cost to their their clients. So everything's a kind of a balance um, of cost and um, effectiveness and application. Um, so yeah, okay. So I've kind of given you maybe a lot of things to think about. So how do you understand your ingredients? Um, my first advice would actually just be to Google it. Um, it sounds quite simple, but um, the internet has a lot of good things out there um, and some are more reliable than others. So take everything with a pinch of salt. But um, just to get it in your brain, um, I went to university for five years, so I I've been coaxed into understanding what all these all these different ingredients do, but um, even I still sometimes have to have a little Google of things um, to understand what that's doing. So what do emulsifiers do in cake? So emulsifiers were on the last um, slide. Um, what are they doing in the cake? How, what, what are they bringing to the cake? And you can just do that with your products, maybe in general terms, maybe um, you just want to know um, what an, an and um, what lactic acid is doing in a product or um, what xanthan gum is doing in a product. It's just really so you understand what kind of applications it's getting used in and what it's bringing. So maybe it's impacting the texture, maybe it's imp impacting the appearance, maybe it's um, really good for shelf life. Um, it'll give you some kind of understanding of um, what it brings um, to your product and you can kind of piece it all together of what, why it's there and 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 how you can maybe switch it out for something else. Um, and you can also just um, 
Google the specific ingredients as well um, and see what comes up um, as their um, applications and functionality. Next is asking an ingredients manufacturer. So the ingredients manufacturers are um, sometimes very helpful, sometimes not, I will say that, but um, they really normally understand their products and how it um, and what applications and they've tried it in or what applications it's suitable for. So just asking them um, if you get a, a colour um, that you want to use, a yellow colour, you should ask them, right, can this be used at a specific pH in a drink or can it be used, um, how much sugar does it need to create the vibrancy of the colour? Um, you can ask them really specific questions and they're normally quite helpful um, to understand that. Do, do be aware that they want to maybe sell you something, so just take it out all with a pinch of salt, but at least it'll kind of hone in on maybe where you can do your product development next. And lastly is to ask a product developer. So if you're working with a product developer currently or are going to in the future, um, it's good to just ask them along the way of, um, you'll normally fill out a, a brief um, for what, whichever product developer you're, you're working with. I want it to be sugar free, I want it to be gluten free, this sort of thing. And they will then go away and research what kind of ingredients they need to put in. And once they've done all that and shown you maybe a few prototypes, maybe just question them on, oh, why did you put that in? What what does that bring into the products? And just asking little questions um, to, to help your understanding, because kind of in the end, this is your product and you're the one that has to live with it and know it and know it inside and out, as someone said earlier. And um, so it's really important that you know what each of your ingredients are doing. We normally just kind of try to explain to our clients as we as we're developing it, why we're putting this product in and um, what the cost implications are, that sort of thing. It's really just to get them to understand um, what, why there are all the ingredients there. It's not just here, here's your product, um, off you go. It's it's more of a, a learning and um, knowledge exchange um, type of project that we do. So that is all for me. That's just our um, email address if you have any um, questions. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask Alistair, I'll stop sharing this just now, if you've mentioned our Thrive programme at all to anyone. Uh, we have, but go ahead. If you want to mention it, please do. Yeah, if we have uh, just two minutes. So ourselves and SRUC um, run a free programme called Thrive. Um, I'm just going to pop a link into the chat to it. Um, it is for start food and drink businesses um, and it's kind of a, a how to guide about um, so SRUC do stuff on pitching, how to pitch your product, how to price your product, um, market research um, and our team um, at QMU do a lot about um, product development, nutrition, um, tasting your product properly, that sort of thing. Um, and then we also have a few extra um, webinars this year on finding funding um, funding and investment opportunities, um, packaging, uh, legislation, and I forgot the last one. <laughs> but um, it's a really good programme. Um, you can just have a wee look uh, in your own time at it. Thank you. Yeah, just just concur with that. And we've we've, we've been, as I say, we as I saw you see, been running that program as well with with QMU. So it, it works in quite nicely to the type of support we can also offer through the tech club. I believe some of the businesses that are involved in the tech club support have have done have been on Thrive before, and it, it really fits in quite nicely the type of stuff that we can we can offer as well. So if you are interested in that, please use the link in the in the chat and and, and register and sign up. I think they've got record numbers this year, so it's getting more popular as we go. So uh, go for that if you can. Thank you very much for your time and your presentations. Uh, we've just coming up to 12 o'clock, so I've just got a couple more slides I just wanted to share and then we'll I'll conclude today. So I'll just share my screen very briefly. And if you can let me know if you can see that, that, that OK. So just to say, um, thank you very much to all our speakers today. That was really fascinating, really a, a topic that I think is, is really interesting and I really enjoyed. Uh, before I finish, I just wanted to let you know uh, of, of some organisations that might be able to help if you're interested in, in food trend support and looking at market research and, and data analysis. So one of the organisations that we work with in the, is the Knowledge Bank, which is part of Scotland Food and Drink. Uh, so they can basically provide uh, businesses with uh, customised market research, data analysis and consumer insights. So things like insights on consumer trends and shopper behaviour intelligence on, on market sectors and categories 
but they've also got a huge uh, um, amount of online resources, so webinars, reports and, and presentations. So if any of the businesses are interested in information about potential market opportunities and data useful for your business or your subsector, then I definitely recommend uh, visiting, visiting their website. Uh, they've got a lot of good information there and they can make make uh, bespoke stuff for for businesses or for subsectors and things uh, so it's yeah a really good resource and certainly recommend you get in touch with them if you're keen to find more uh, from our side we've got a couple of uh, support packages that are going to be available soon and we certainly like to recommend that you guys uh, if you're interested that you apply for the support the first one is bespoke one-to-one -one support so any business in the Highlands area can apply for this intensive one to one support where so you get a food and drink expert who will work with your business to overcome a, a certain challenge. Uh, we've just completed the first five projects. There's three going on at the moment and we're going to be funding another three projects in August. That's some of the quotes for some of the from some of the businesses that have received support. So basically, uh, we will give you an expert that will work with you closely to offer hands-on guidance to support your business to, to overcome a particular problem. Uh, so it could be in areas like product development, uh, prototype testing, packaging, food safety, equipment specifications, uh, factory layout and design, branding, marketing, business planning, e-commerce. So anything that you could, your business might be, maybe doesn't have the resource or is maybe challenging at the moment, we can certainly let you uh, allocate you a, an expert that can work with you complete, completely free of charge. So you get three days time of a consultant. So that's guaranteed at least one and a half days working with you directly. So that could be through Zoom, Zoom meetings uh, or, or if it's if it's depending on where the consultant is, it could be a, a site visit and so forth, offering you advice. Uh, if you're interested in that, we'd ask you to get in contact with myself. That's my email address there. And we'll set you up with a My High and the My High database and My High account so you can you can apply there. The second area that we're, we're offering support from at the moment is common interest groups. So if you're interested in collaborating with like-minded businesses uh, to overcome on the ongoing challenges or seizing your opportunities, then the, the Tech Hub's offering uh, businesses to opportunity to formally come together to form these common interest groups. So it gives you not basically an opportunity to collaborate with other like-minded entrepreneurs and businesses, and then you get the benefit of having a specialist facilitator facilitator that can bring the group together and, and bring in external people to support and try and understand the challenges and, and how to best overcome them. So if you work in the same food and drink subsector, the same geographical area, or have similar issues to overcome or similar plans for future development, it's a great opportunity to collaborate and, and share best practice and work together. We currently have two groups operational at the moment. The first one is the Highland Distillers Group, where we've got about 15 distillers working together to see what opportunities are for, for collaboration and for joint working. And we've also got a group of businesses in the Black Isle that are doing a project to see and showcase the, the local food that's available in the Black Isle and how the island, the Black Isle could be um, self-sufficient in certain certain uh, crops and, and food products. So they're, they're two exciting projects, but we're also looking forward to, to for more. So if you, if you apply and you're successful, you'll be allocated a facilitator who will work with you bring in external people to support the project and then take it from there. So if you have an idea for a group or like to collaborate with other businesses, we certainly recommend that you, you apply for this. Uh, if you don't have a member of a group already or or you haven't contacted any other members, then it doesn't matter. You can apply anyway and then our facilitator will do that and then help you help find other members that could join the group. So just to let you know, the deadline for the, both these packages is, um, is 4 p.m. on Friday, 25th of August. So you are interested. We certainly recommend that you that you apply, but there'll be more information coming out on social media and on the website over the coming months to try and drum up some interest for them. Also, a uh, last thing to say is really is that we've got uh, the podcast, which is, is really growing momentum now. Uh, we have uh, the podcast, which is called Food and Drink Business Bites. It's now live. It's available on our website. You can scan uh, the QR code there to, to listen to them. We've done four already and the fifth one will be coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and also these these episodes you can get on your usual platforms for, for listening to podcasts and include the interviews with businesses that we've that we've worked with in the past. And episode five is uh, with, with Kira Bull from Gledfield Distillery, who's been involved in a couple of our projects and also as part of the distillers group. So yeah, great listen to and also gives you information about other things that are happening 
in the in the Highlands uh, in the Highlands and, uh, Enterprise and in the area that are that are useful for food and drink businesses. We also have an event feedback form, which is the QR code there. Uh, so if you can do that, that would be great. But if not, I'll I'll be sending an email out uh, today or tomorrow with with the slides and uh, the feedback form. So we'd be delighted if you could spend just a couple of minutes to give us some feedback on on how you filmed the event today. So that is uh, that's us today. So uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. I'll stop presenting. Uh, so really, just to, to finally say um, thank you very much for for joining us today. I hope you found that useful. I'd like to thank our, our three speakers for some really fascinating and insightful presentations. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll be in touch in the next couple of days with the slides. We'll also have recorded the session today. So we'll be sharing a recording as well and putting that onto the, onto the Tech Hub website. So thank you very much. And uh, please go on the Tech Hub website and you can see up, upcoming opportunities to get involved in, in the project. So thank you and um, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.